With that, we'll call the meeting to order, and if the record will show that we have uh, uh, all three of the members of the Finance and Audit Committee meeting, uh, our board our committee uh, here, as well as uh, our chairman, uh, Lenny Mendonca. With that being stated, uh, we'll start with public comment. We only have one, and that's uh, David Schweigel, please. Good morning. Greetings, FNA Committee. David Schwegel, Apex Civil Engineering, with three items. First, glad to see the project, the star of the show, at the California Economic Summit a couple of weeks back. Stay in the infrastructure drives the economy forward conversation by participating in the California Infrastructure Symposium on Friday, April 3rd, 2020, Hilton Arden West. We look forward to the favorable reply to Director Arambula and Chairman Donsa to the speaking invitations. Second, special thanks to Apex Civil Engineering and the County of Fresno for giving me the opportunity to make a 929 mile journey up to Microsoft for the Cascadia Rail Summit. Extraordinary synergy. Either they're gonna build HSR between Portland, Vancouver via Seattle, or that corridor is gonna become a 316 mile long parking lot. What we need to focus on is transitioning Fresno Clovis into a destination rivaling that of Vancouver, BC. Third and finally, I explained to Arcadis that as a licensed professional civil engineer in the state of California and the change order manager on CP23, I needed to be at the entire US High Speed Rail Association conference in Los Angeles back in April and May to talk to these delegates from all over the world about change order management best practices. Arcata said no. To make matters worse, to induce me to make a move that was very expensive and labor intensive, they said, we only hire long term, project goes till 2023. They laid me off after 11 weeks in violation of California Labor Code 970B and the Professional Civil Engineers Act I ask that we fire Arcadis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swigel. There being no further public comments, we'll move into today's agenda. The first item is the approval uh, of the board of the committee meeting minutes for uh, October 15th meeting. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion. One, yes. one, one yes, comment I'd like to make. Sure, on item number two on the past agenda, it, it most of our the reports have come to us for saying that uh, a member has asked questions, but they don't tell us what the questions were, so we're not sure as to whether or not um, everything is complete. So it would be helpful if if uh, whoever's putting this together would would cite the questions that are being asked. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, that's not a change to the minutes, I don't think, but a no. request for going forward. All right. So we have a motion and a second for approval of the minutes. All in favor? Right. Thank you. Passed unanimously. Uh, moving on to item two, um, I'm going to waive any comments this morning and uh, hear from our internal audit manager, Paula. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paula Rivera. I'm Chief Auditor for the Authority. And I'm here to present the, um, this year's internal audit plan uh, and last year's internal quality assessment. Um, the audit plan is a combination of carryover work from last year's plan uh, and new audits based on input. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, from Finance and Audit Committee and Executive Management. Uh, this year's plan represents um, a diligent effort to match our current resources uh, with the audits that we have on the plan. The internal audit quality assessment um, is one of three parts of our quality assurance process. All audit work papers go through two levels of management review before we issue an audit report. Once a year, we have um, someone who was not involved with the audits that was issued, essentially the other audit manager, go through and look at the work papers and see if we've complied with internal audit standards. 
which is what I bring today. Uh, and the third portion is an, inter an audit peer review, which is coming in February. Uh, then we have external auditors from other state departments come in and take a look at our process to be sure that we are following our audit manual, internal audit standards, and the GAO audit standards. So the internal international standards for the professional practice of internal auditing require that I bring um, the audit plan to the full board for approval of resources and um, planned activities, and that I communicate the results of our quality assessment program to the full board. So I'm bringing them here today um, for your information. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I might, might say, and as uh, members of this committee are aware, and I think our board, um, we uh, are feeling your pain with uh, trying to place uh, auditors to join your staff and recognize that you uh, have more than a full-time job. But I would also say, Paula, that um, as we stated in the past, uh, your department is doing a terrific job and a true benefit to the uh, taxpayers of the state of California. We appreciate it very much. Um, as the members of this committee know, uh, this is an information item for us. This is a board action at the board today. Um, if there are no questions other than, again, congratulations on a great job and uh, hopefully on a search for additional staff. Um, we appreciate the report and we'll move on to uh, the executive summary of uh, the uh, Chief Financial Officer, Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm going to be working off the uh, pages that are the uh, Financial Reports Executive Summary uh, tab, which may also appear on the uh, on the screen here in a minute. But I'll go ahead and get started on page two, which starts with the Accounts pay Payable Aging and Disputes Report. And happy to report again that the authority has not had an aged invoice uh, now for 25 months and has not made a payment penalty for 32 months. I do credit my, my staff for keeping a close eye on this. They frequently raise issues to the executive level if we have one that's nearing a, a late deadline and we, we're able to resolve it with the, uh, with the other programs. Um, the cash management report is on the same page. Our uh, balances through the end of September for Proposition 1A uh, were 514 million. I can have a report that a new Prop 1A bond sale occurred on October 24th, and the Treasurer's Office, uh, uh, Fiona Ma, was able to sell an additional 375 million in Prop 1A bonds. And in addition, we have 9 million beyond that in commercial paper. But that sale that occurred in October provides an additional 25 million for administrative costs and 350 million for construction. Uh, the cap and trade uh, balances fell by 20 million month over month. Uh, the new total at the end of September was uh, 2 billion 180 million. Uh, there's actually a auction going on today and we'll be able to report that at uh, the December board meeting what the uh, preliminary results of that November auction is. Uh, the last four cap and trade auctions uh, have totaled uh, 762 million uh, for the authority. Moving on to the, uh, the next page, uh, administrative budget and expenditures report with 25% uh, of the fiscal year completed uh, the authority has spent 15.6% or 8.8 .8 million of the total administrative budget. And that uh, total budget is 56.2 million for the fiscal year. Um, as of September 30th, the authority's vacancy rate was 28.4%, which is 77 positions vacant uh, out of our total of 271 authorized positions. Uh, we received an update as of yesterday, and eight more vacancies have been filled. Uh, so that uh, reduces our vacancy uh, uh, percentage from 28.4 uh, to 25.5 percent, and our uh, vacancies would fall from 77 to 69 vacancies again as of yesterday. Uh, Brian, is there any way? 
is there any way to forecast a uh, closure rate on the vacancies? I mean, if we were if we were to forecast through the balance of this fiscal year, would we have? Uh, are we able to do any kind of a forecast that gives us any sort of comfort in where we might be at the end of the fiscal year? The concern we've always raised, and I'm sure that in management are doing the same, is the ability to get the job done with less uh, staff than have been appropriated. Right. Well, and I, I can uh, tell you that we have uh, active recruitments right now of 46 positions. So that uh, means that 10 of the 46 are currently <laughs> pending offers. So you know, we find out how many of those offers are accepted and people we bring on board of those, of those 10. Uh, eight are in the conducting interviews uh, stage of uh, interviewing candidates. Uh, eight are currently having applications screened. And we have uh, 20 of 46 that are in active recruitment that are in the advertised section where we're open for applications uh, through a certain date. So we do have 46 that are active um, and, you know, trying to uh, narrow the gap as, as quickly as we can. But, you know, it, it's certainly month to month a bit unpredictable because, you know, sometimes we do do another round of interviews or sometimes we occasionally fill a position with a current state employee that results in another vacancy. But, uh, again, the, the pace uh, you've seen over the last uh, – uh, the last six weeks is is about uh, eight positions uh, filled, mm -hmm. so we would hope to uh, meet or exceed that going forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, slide, uh, capital outlay budget. Um, the monthly expenditures uh, for the month of September totaled uh, $112 million. Uh, it's broken out by the design build uh, contract specifically in the last bullet here under this section in the middle of the page. Mm -hmm. uh, total design build uh, expenditures were 36.2 million and that splits up to CP1 being 11.1 .1 million, CP23 being 16.2 million and CP4 being 9 million. Um, a couple of the largest three categories to give you perspective of where the rest of the spending was. Uh, right away, a total of 27 million for the month. Uh, bookend expenditures, that's the Caltrain project, uh, the Rosecrans Marquardt grade separation and the San Mateo grade separation. Uh, spending total 14 million uh, for September. And the third uh, largest uh, category then was the Kings County legal settlement that went out in that month and that was 12.5 million. Our uh, preliminary numbers for the month of October uh, show capital outlay expenditures of 89 million, which uh, of which uh, 48 million was uh, design build expenditures and we'll of course have that detail in next month's reporting. Thanks for the update on that, Deborah. Sure. That's, that's very helpful, by the way. Um, next, uh, bottom of the page here, we have total expenditures with forecast, and there's a focus in this section on the federal match. Um, this uh, shows that uh, before federal disengagement, uh, we had $476 million of match approved <clears throat> by the Fed, federal government. Uh, we now have, as of September, uh, 753 million that are at, at FRA pending approval, but they have not been active in reviewing our uh, submittals to certify match for about a year now. And uh, I think as of uh, uh, this week, that uh, amount that's pending at FRA is actually over 800 million now. So that is our, our largest category. Uh, we have additionally other uh, monies that are uh, invoices that are in process at, at high speed rail. And that includes both where we're uh, just verifying the invoice and the documentation prior to, uh, prior to submittal to FRA. And there's some additionally where uh, we're, we're holding on reserve until we get FRA engagement again to uh, go through some of the nature of those, those, uh, those matches. Uh, Next page, uh, contracts and expenditure report. Uh, 
as of September, the authority had 197 active contracts with about seven billion in value. Um, our small business uh, rate uh, remains good uh, in September, 21.6 percent, um, which is uh, relatively constant, but but up a, a couple tenths of a percent from uh, from prior months. Uh, the projects and initiatives. Uh, uh, primarily shows uh, project uh, status and risk and uh, the uh, changes from the prior month in that area were um, the Palmdale to Burbank timeline status changed from uh, satisfactory to uh, escalate or yellow uh, due to issues around the Una Lake avoidance and that's a, a fish and wildlife. There's Army, Army Corps issue, right? yeah. Una Lake, yeah. It's Army Corps. And uh, secondarily, uh, CP1 and CP4 uh, showed a status change as well from satisfactory to caution as new uh, right-of-way uh, requirements are built into those, uh, those timelines. Uh, the last issue in the executive summary on uh, page six is the uh, report of contingency use uh, for the month of uh, uh, September. Uh, we're reporting uh, for contingency use under 25 million uh, issues. There were a uh, total 28 million of contingency use assigned. Uh, there was one that exceeded 25 million. Uh, that is listed here, the Herndon Avenue uh, grade separation. Uh, that's a, uh, an issue where uh, uh, the grade separation is, is, has been modified from the original design, which had a viaduct over Herndon and retained the freight rail at grade crossing of Herndon. And in uh, agreements with the railroad and also city of Fresno, uh, the uh, high-speed rail uh, grade separation is, is lowered a bit so it can accommodate a full grade separation for Herndon Avenue, both for high-speed rail and the freight line as well. And Brian, so for the one that's over 25 million, the process that was followed was what? So under the uh, the delegation that uh, the board adopted with the May project baseline, uh, where we uh, have contingency for these purposes, such as this one, uh, it goes through the uh, business oversight committee. If it's over 25 million, it goes to the executive committee, where the which the CEO chairs, and anything over. Uh, 25 million is reported to the board chair and also the FNA committee during the FNA meetings. So that was that was uh, I will also on contingency I mentioned one was approved yesterday in addition to this one by the ex uh, executive board and Brian Kelly is going to report that one out in his CEO report to the full board and will uh, indicate it as well in the FNA reporting next month. Okay. And that concludes the uh, financial office reporting. Any uh, questions for uh, Mr. Anna? I'm just going to congratulate you again on uh, reconstituting and defining these reports, uh, Brian. And I, you may have thought that I pushed back a little bit, um, but I'm happy uh, that I acquiesced because it's just much more readable, uh, much shorter and providing uh, probably as uh, available information as we had before and easier to find. Great. So well, thank credit, you. Credit goes to staff. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hedges, you have. Yes, sir. Um, let's brief off, if we can, the Central Valley Status Report, which was sent out, out to you. It should be at the back of your books. If not, there's a copy in front of you, color. It is your. It is in your inclusion in your F and A books. It makes for the briefest, quickest summary for this information. It hasn't been updated from what's in our books, right? This is. This yeah. is. You, okay, you have great. a current. All right. <laughs> Slide two. Slide two is the promise. What I call the S curve. This is reflective of the work that's ongoing with the rebaselining of the schedules with regards to CP1 through four. It shows currently that we've expended approximately a little bit over $2 billion with about $1.74 billion to go as to be able to achieve ARA. 
Now you'll see that right now that the top of that S curve is in July of 22. That's reflective of wrapping up the projects and probably there will be some type two structures that will be ongoing in that latter period. Type two is structures that carries vehicles over our rail, not structures that carry our rail. So that's the fulfillment of the RR grants. Okay. This will allow us then to proceed with tracking systems and to advance tracking systems to the lay track. And as the plan right now is was briefed to you in five mile segments. So that's being interlaid into these re baseline schedules as we speak. A lot of work ongoing right now, both at the project, state project teams and the contractor project teams as to rework these schedules, sinking in the, the actual right away need dates and the land conveyance dates into these schedules. So hopefully at this point, we will identify what I call the red parcels, which is parcels that are tied to critical path, present them in and we are now focusing on those parcels. I'll explain that a little bit later as we move on. Okay. Slide three. Slide three is a, is a, is a, is a down look at this. What this shows you for the month of April that we're approximately $3 million Delta off was our plan. However, though, in October 19, the expenditures are picking up as I've been able to show you that we're, we're going to be at a projected about 46, 47 million dollars. So there is a slight ramp. Now, what you will see though is that as we go into the November, December, I'm um, time from January, the moratoriums for the railroad construction. This is their high traffic. So they're very sensitive. They reduced our number of hours that we can work at the railroads. So you're gonna see during the December, January months, kind of a flattening, and then those should be picking up again as we come into summer. Okay. And also too, we'd also have the bad winter months coming up. Page four. Page four is a holistic view of what, where we should be with regards to clearance of structures and alignment. As you can see that we're slightly behind schedule. This is predominantly driven by land acquisition and out, out grant deeds, um, being able to move that first order work. And that's our focus right now. We have many issues underway and are very close. I think you will see that in the December timeframe that that 30 structures closing. And remember the structures is what's critical. That's where the predominance of um, the money is in these long structures. And that is where critical path is. That's our focus right now. Slide 13, slide 13 goes through. It highlights with each or slide five, um, I don't know why it's 13 up there, but um, slide five in, in the book, basically what it does is, is that it gives you the explanations of lag. Um, predominantly, as you can see, the majority that from top down is first order work, which is, which is right now, it is linked to the being able to convey out grants. Out grants is a function of acquisition so the end result is being able to give out grants and to move these utilities for example, this would be CP one um, the critical path right now is the at and work. This is the cutover of the glass. We're pushing right now, working with Tudor Perini as to accelerate the civil work or actually not to accelerate, but to push forward that excel that civil work as to make sure that at and is in an optimum position as to do that cutover that the controlling is not the civil, but it is actually the welding of the glass. Same thing that you see basically all the way down through two, three, it's driven there predominantly by right away land rights again. CP4 is a slightly different there. Is so that what you see in CP4 is that there's a couple utility districts that we need to work through, i.e. semi-tropic, which would be one of the, the holding. Hopefully um, our resolution went before the board. They gave us a favorable um, 
my goal is by next month is to have something negotiated um, with them as in to allow us to resolve their utilities and land issues. So sweeping to page six. Page six looks daunting, right? But it's actually, it's a good news story. In July, I reported that we had a possible of over 400 new parcels to add into the existing um, 319 parcels that we had remaining. Now, as you can see, we've been able to work diligently, um, predominantly in, in working in the redesigns, looking for workarounds, and we're able to push that, that additional parcel out down to about 130 parcels as of date. So not a bad news story here. You can see that we are, we are making progress in right away. The objective here in right away, we spent a lot of attention here as we came through and we've done a lot of Lean Six Sigma initiatives as in to try to streamline these processes down. You'll see that in the notes, taking processes from 140 days down to 40 days looking at ways at becoming more efficient and more effective in that delivery. So much a big, strong emphasis right now on design and working with our consultants who do the majority of the delivery and the appraisal process for us. So linking every parcel to a schedule in right away, holding right away accountable for production and then two, linking those back to these re-baseline schedules. Everything is coherent now or becoming coherent. Next slide, you'll see in agreements. Maybe I don't know. Agreements, um, as you can see right now, is that um, agreements are, are moving forward. There is, um, we are pushing forward. The issues here on page eight, you can see that I've already mentioned them. It's that semi-tropic, which is um, driving basically um, CP4. All the other agreements are in progress and currently not holding up design. We have the ability right now with all of these utility districts that they are approving our designs and marching our designs forward, allowing us to prepare to convey for land. Next you would see is environmental permits and clearance. That would be on page nine. Good news story here is that the last of the major permits um, should be approved this Friday. We have commitment with regards to the South of Wasco um, that it is currently being um, finalized and should be issued. Deer Creek, Cross Creek, um, they've already been issued in King River, as indicated here, King River Complex was issued. So we've, we had very good um, cooperation with regards to CDFW as we push forward. Now we have some other agreements that we'll need to push forward. These will be the stream agreements and, and marching forward. Now switching to a deep dive onto CP1, I point out that up into the right-hand corner of CP1 where it shows zero contingency, is an error um, that is in a future slide. Um, in fact, said page 12, that will show the actual contingency left and a planned expenditure out of that contingency. Currently right now, the contract completion date for CP1 is November 2nd of 21. And there's approximately just under $700 million or seven, $631 million to expense on this contract. There is no major change orders to report the execution this month. Here you can see this is the current value with remaining in the contingency, just over about a billion dollars. 
this would be the plan drawdown curve on that um, billion dollars. I point out that currently the negotiation for the realignment of the Northern extension to Madeira is underway, that's finalizing. There's ongoing negotiations there and the design for the final of the intrusion barrier protection system is also underway. Now also too, the intrusion barrier um, protection system right now is holding up about three miles of guide wire work that we can complete. This currently is, as you can see, this is the expend rate for to complete out CP1. This will be updated to reflect performance against actual. You can see here with regards to the progression of, of work that the holding factors with regards to CP1 is you can see right now is that it is predominantly driven by that utility work, which is the first order work that I referenced prior. AT&T, PG&E, and there's also in that would be is our ongoing work with UPRR. I'm glad to report UPRR as their cooperation has become a little bit better. We're making some inroads. The Herndon design was approved without comment, which is a first um, for the, the authority um, last month. So we are making some we are making some inroads with them. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, so it looks to me when I take these reports you're going through that you're making significant progress. And in terms of your estimated completion, it looks really good, I think, in terms of definitely the third party agreements. I'm not so sure about the landowner delays and whether or not you anticipate that those negotiations to continue longer than you Obviously, they're longer than you originally thought, but is this is there anything significantly um, delay and or cost it doesn't appear to me when I review when I review these, but is there anything that's jumping out at you that you feel like you need to say something about? Um, right now, it, let me point out that in all three of these contracts. It is going to be a Herculean effort of both the state and the contractor as in to be able to achieve our, is it achievable? Yes. Now it's predicated upon us being able to deliver our land acquisition and the land conveyances on time. Now, with regards to the land out, the deeds, um, out grants, I'm on process right now, our processes is, are been refined. We brought some extra support aboard as in to help out on that. Um, big effort, right? And it's breaking um, almost. The it's all right. It's a, it's breaking almost a static zero as we move these things forward. But you're starting to see this month that we are starting to make some inroads with PG&E, work plans are starting to go through with UP. So there is good news on all fronts. Joe, is the PG&E problem more third party agreements? Is that? No, it isn't third party agreements. The issue is it's in the actual conveyance of the land deeds itself mechanics of being able to grant those easements, those franchises. Um, we've worked through those those issues. I met with the execs of their, at their VP level um, last week or week before. They, they gave me their full support that they're, we'll put as much staff on it as, as needed as to keep pace. Now what we need to do is this, to be blunt, is we need to flood them with out grants. We need to move these out grants processing through our system to them, right? And to make 
and make the backlog to them. And that's what's underway right now. We had it, like I said, is the biggest issue was, was standing back, looking at ourselves, redefining our processes from ground zero, trying to figure out what was non-added value steps, removing those non-added value steps, and more importantly, putting a stringent tracking and control system in place so we can see as each of the basically the, the ROIs, which is the, what initiates out grants, moves through mapping through the outcome process. So you feel you have adequate staff to push that effort? We have brought on some additional staff. We're looking for more support as we speak. Yeah, we could use support. And we're outreaching right now through Brian out to Caltrans and looking at our other options to try to, to use anything that's available to us. Um, we brought in another consultant to help with the mapping process, the early stages. So any place that we can look, we, we did a whole analysis, whole life cycle analysis of the process, looking for where the backlogs are, where our traditional air problems have been, and trying to focus on those problems to fix them. And the big issue that we had was mapping, which is an internal issue of surveying, of going through defining what is these parcels and then be able to convey these these deeds out. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just on that, <clears throat> on that regard, we're, we are in the middle of um, some negotiation on bringing in some additional expertise in this area. And I hope to report to the board in uh, December that we've concluded that, that work. So thank you. You can see right now, these are being refined, by the way, too, as we speak with regards to the row schedules, trying to push these up, looking, it's, it's an ongoing hand in glove process with the contractors. What we need, the key to being able to complete to ARA is truly achieving schedules that are meaningful and significant to both the contractor and to the state. And to be able to identify out of this, what you will see what we're working on right now, the next step of this is a risk plan and risk identification that identifies these are the things that must happen to be able to achieve this execution, that initial, that S curve. And that's where, that's our focus right now, working with, with the contractors, not only to identify their risk, but also to identify the state risk. You can see that this is right here it is the row summary that shows you what, what we need to produce as in to advance our goal of trying to complete row within the calendar year of 20. Big issue to do that. This is land conveyances. Land conveyances is a Herculean effort. There's approximately about a thousand land conveyances that need to occur prior to the utility moving and about another 1600 that we're able to do post after they are moved. The focus right now is that thousand, right? Pushing that through. Our goal is about 40 a week as in to see if we can push about 40 of these land conveyances through a week as we start c coming up on step. This is CP23, as you can see here, again, as we've moved with the, with the, 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 what Brian will brief here in a minute, you can see that the current contractual completion date is 522-20. Um, that basically allows us to complete all the type two structures, type one structures right now, the plan is to have them complete right at about the first um, January 1 of 20 um, of, of 21 as to the complete this actually this contract completion date has not been pushed up to reflect the the new basically April contract completion date reflected the, by the mod that Brian is going to report out on. Here are the executive, here is the executed change orders. As you can see that have, that have come down. These change orders are, are a good news story. 
the change order backlog is substantial here. We're pushing through these change orders. This is allowing us then to push through and to basically to execute this get to work strategy. Again, you can see that we're just over about $937 million left in our contingency um, as we push forward. Uh, George, we have a, is there a plan B in the event? I mean, uh, realizing the construction dollars are, are in fact going up, um, which um, looks much better, but, but still will not meet at the rate we're going meet the 2022 date is there a plan b to accelerate that at some point yeah there right now is what we're looking at we're going through in our risk mitigation strategy looking at opportunities for possible acceleration if we have to i want to be very careful with acceleration i want to identify that these are actually things that we can accelerate that you can define by milestone that allow basically a binary achievement. Now, what do I mean by that? Is this, is the contractor achieves this milestone and he is entitled to acceleration. If achievement is not occurred, then there was no acceleration. We wanna work through those and make sure that we clearly understand where those opportunities for acceleration are and that there is an ROI, a rate of return on investment to be able to do that. Well, they get, I mean, with any acceleration on a, construction contract, generally we pay them in addition to what we have budgeted. Um, so do we have a reserve for that? There is, if you look in, into the P70 models, there is, there is money in the P70s for that. Now, will it be adequate? I'm not sure right now. Okay, and we'll have to go through one of the things as part of this rebaseline schedule We'll be back going through back through those budgets as in to look to ensure that the contingency is adequate. Will that come back to this committee to find out if in fact we do have dollars that we can pay that to accomplish the uh, 2022 day? Uh, absolutely. What you'll see is is it'll require us to come back to committee with regards to to revising the baselines if that's what Brian wants to do. That's what it'll. That's what it'll require. The baseline is set right now. Remember, we were very definite in the baseline where we identified contingency to line item. That is not a large pool sum of money, but it is tied to specific risk, with a P70 analysis to that risk, with significance and the impact costs associated with that. As we look at the numbers, one and four seem to be progressing at an accelerated rate where we have our biggest risk is probably in two, three, because it's largest. Yeah, two, three is the biggest risk. Two, three is where the critical path of the program is. It lies in predominantly four structures. These are the long viaduct structures that I have not started right now that we're pushing to start. And that's Deer Creek, Cross Creek, Kings River Complex, and Conejo. Those are the four structures that there is we're pushing on right now to get underway. Okay. Sorry, do you want me to finish up here or do you want just to, you want me just to wrap up? How do you want me to drive through? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But again, is hopefully what I like to do is, is maybe next month is be able to replace what is currently in the F and A with all the multiple appendixes with this little bit simpler format that gives you a much clearer picture of where we're at and the emphasis. And we're working with Tom to try to refine that. So hopefully we can do that. Mm -hmm. Sir, any other questions? That concludes the business. I'd also like to uh, make sure the record is uh, also reflects that we also have two other board members who have joined us today in the audience and have been here for the entire time, and that's uh, Director Shank and 
Director Gil Metti. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, do you have anything? Brian? Say what? Oh, Henry's in the back. Thank you. I didn't see. Hey, there you are, Henry. And also, uh, Mr. Perea, Director Perea is also here. Um, with all that, the uh, business of the Foot Finance and Audit Committee is completed, and we'll have about a 30 minute, uh, we at 10 o'clock, aren't we? Brian, are you sure you haven't got anything? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. The meeting is adjourned. We'll uh, join you again at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>